we've had a really great term together, a great relationship, and we're both very honored to sign the document. They've traded insults and threatened to wipe each other out. Now Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un have made history by shaking hands in Singapore. It was the first time a sitting U.S. president had ever met the leader of North Korea. At the heart of their discussion, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. Before the summit, many observers were concerned the two had very different ideas of what that actually means. But the spectacle ended with Kim committing to completely denuclearize and establish new and positive relations with Washington. So has this been a masterstroke by Donald Trump or has Kim Jong-un fooled everyone? Natalie Pohonen reports. Small steps for a president and a chairman one giant leap for diplomacy. The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un joked with US President Donald Trump that their meeting seemed like a science fiction movie. But the two men appeared to have created a reality show of their own. Just weeks ago, both sides were trading insults, and this meeting was called off. But after a few minutes of coming face to face in Singapore, it was all smiles. On the table was an agreement for the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which would bring North Korea into the fold of the international community. U.S. sanctions will remain in place until then. The Americans haven't revealed what concessions they'll grant Kim or what the next steps will be in negotiations. The North Koreans haven't said what they'll do when they return to Pyongyang either. And we have developed a, a very special bond. So uh, people are going to be very impressed. People are going to be very happy. And we're going to take care of a very big and very dangerous problem for the world. For a world watching a once-in-a-generation meeting, history has already been made. But what will happen in the next episode of the Kim and Trump show? President Trump is walking in the footsteps of former American President Richard Nixon. He travelled to China in 1972 and met the Chinese leadership, including Chairman Mao Zedong. It would still take seven years for formal ties to be established, but that meeting was crucial to opening up the country to the rest of the world. The Singapore summit could prove another milestone for East Asia. The past does not have to define the future. Yesterday's conflict does not have to be tomorrow's war. And as history has proven over and over again, adversaries can indeed become friends. The North Korean regime has isolated itself and its people. Defectors describe a dictatorship run on indoctrination and punishment for those who don't accept the party line. Trump says he did bring up human rights. However, the main focus of this summit was always reducing the nuclear threat. The US is not calling for regime change. But could we see a change in the way the regime interacts with the world? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, let's go to our panel now. Joining me from Washington, we have Han Park. He's the founding director of the Center for the Study of Global Issues. And also in Washington, D.C. is Bruce Klingner. He's the CIA's former deputy division chief for Korea and is now a senior research fellow for Korean affairs at the Heritage Foundation. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Han Park, let me begin with you. You're always extremely optimistic whenever I talk to you that North Korea can come in from the cold. So let me ask you now, is the deed done? Has it happened? Is North Korea finally in from the cold? No, actually the written agreement uh, at Singapore 
was not sufficient enough. There was no concept of complete, uh, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Those four words were not there. But, uh, but North Korea itself evidently is committed to complete denuclearization of the peninsula rather than of the DPRK. Right. So that is a very important one. And we have to think about American nuclear umbrella there in that region as a part of denuclearization. Interesting point, so, yes. Yes, interesting point. I wonder if some people would see that just as semantics or if it's something that's a, a real sticking point. Let me ask you, Bruce, big picture. Uh, the summit was huge on symbolism, but do you agree with Han Park that it was low on details? It, it was very low on details. Uh, each of the four major provisions in that uh, summit statement were in previous agreements with North Korea. Uh, and in many cases, they were uh, stronger and more uh, encompassing in the previous commitments. So this was really a, a watered down reiteration of previous commitments. And uh, as he points out, that uh, CVID was not included, uh, which the administration had been hinting that Pyongyang was moving towards uh, CVID, which is a UN requirement, uh, but certainly that's not included in the summit statement. Right. So, Bruce, uh, talking about what Han Park brought up, the text saying complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, is there devil in that particular detail, Korean Peninsula, rather than it being DPRK? Should we be looking at that closely? Uh, very much so. Uh, North Korea has different definitions for a, a number of, of uh, issues. Uh, the, the U.S. negotiator back in the six party talks you know, agreed to the North Korean uh, request not to single them out. So instead of saying denuclearization of the DPRK, it was the Korean Peninsula. The U.S. view was that half of the peninsula is already denuclearized, so it's really just of the, of the, the North. Uh, but the North defines uh, the Korean Peninsula in a more uh, broad terms than we would. We would see it as the landmass. They see it as anything that influences or impacts mm. the peninsula. So that would include nuclear uh, aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, even the bombers way down in Guam would be considered part of the Korean peninsula, according to North Korea. Yeah, I'm glad you made that point. That's really fascinating. Han Park, when we've spoken in the past, you've always reiterated that what the North Koreans want ultimately is to be treated with respect. They want a seat at the table, they don't want to be ridiculed, and they want to be re treated with respect. Did they get the respect that they've so craved throughout these, these years? Did they get that respect in Singapore? Yes, they, they got the respect by virtue of being part of this uh, very important summit meeting with American president. Uh, but beyond that, they, they North Koreans haven't, haven't lost anything here. North Korea wants to be recognized as a normal state with a nuclear capability. That is capability rather than nuclear state. Mm -hmm. North Korea is nuclear capable. No one can do anything about that. So that is not really precisely discussed. So North Korea would like to be regarded as a nuclear capable state and respected a normal state. That will be further achieved with diplomatic normalization with the United States. Based on what we see last a couple of days, I think that is in the picture. Normalization of relations, exchange of embassies with America. So, you know, he will visit the uh, White House and vice versa. Uh, reciprocation of visit, that will help diplomatic normalization. Right. North Korea, what they wanted. Okay, so Bruce Klingler, let me ask you, in the calculations that are going on within the White House, within the State Department, within the DOD, have they, or even within the CIA, um, have they decided, okay, if we can get these guys to denuclearize, forget about human rights, forget about all of that stuff, we can allow them to be a totalitarian state, it's worth it because we'll be preventing nuclear war. Is that the thinking? 
Well, we're, we're not quite sure. The, certainly the human rights community would like human rights included in any discussions. And at least in the past, with previous administrations, uh, the idea was that the, the U.S. would not formally recognize North Korea or establish uh, formal diplomatic relations uh, as long as North Korea was a purveyor of crimes against humanity uh, uh, on the state sponsors of terrorism. So uh, it's more than just exchanging ambassadors or exchanging embassies. It was seen as kind of a recognition of the nature of the regime. So we don't know if President Trump has a, has a different view than previous administrations. Okay, let's bring in Sung Yun Lee now. Uh, who is the Kim Koo Korea Foundation Professor of Korean Studies at Tufts University. Uh, so great to have you on the program as well. Big historic summit. You've always been a voice of skepticism and being cautiously optimistic whenever we've had good news coming out of the North Korea issue. How do you feel right now? Do you feel we've seen this movie before and we need to be skeptical? Or are you genuinely optimistic like so many other people are? I'm very optimistic that Kim Jong-un had a wonderful day, a resounding success in Singapore, as I had expected all along. To put what just transpired in a historical context, let me remind our viewers. The last time that a U.S. president was preparing to meet with his North Korean counterpart, that was Bill Clinton, in late 2000, great dividends accrued came to North Korea. That year, the father, Kim Jong-il, came out of his isolationist shell, dramatically called for the first ever inter-Korean summit, which happened in mid-June. And a fortnight before that important me meeting, Kim Jong-il took a secret trip. To where? Beijing. Why? Because he had an important meeting coming up with a South Korean leader and wanted to discuss it over with his patrons. That was the first ever foreign foray by Kim Jong-il. That was the first visit to China six years after inheriting power in 1994. So do you see a pattern here? Kim Jong-un made his first visit to China six years after inheriting power in 2011. Uh, just about a month before his meeting with Moon Jae-in of South Korea. Next month, in July, after the inter-Korean summit, Vladimir Putin visits Kim Jong-il, the first ever visit by the top Russian or former Soviet leader. Why? Due to the violent mood swing, the dramatic change in the dynamics in the region. Then Kim Jong-il sends an envoy to Bill Clinton, invites him to Pyongyang, and Clinton is very keen on making the trip. First, he sends his Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, to meet Kim Jong-il in North Korea. That visit takes just 12 days after the North Korean envoy's meeting in the White House with Bill Clinton. And Clinton could not really make the visit because of the vote recount in the wake of the presidential election on November 7th. And Al Gore did not concede defeat until mid-December. So simply, time ran out on Clinton. Just one more example, if I may. The next January, Kim Jong-il visits southern China, the province of Guangdong, where you have the special economic zone in the cities, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Zhuhai. And Kim Jong-il was repeating the southern tour, so-called, undertaken by Deng Xiaoping, the architect of China's reform and opening, that visit took place in January and February of 1992. What did the world say? Look, we have the second coming of Deng Xiaoping, right. a reform-minded North Korean leader. Things will get better. That was 18 years ago. Nothing really happened in terms of genuine reform or denuclearization. Imagine the excitement that will greet Kim Jong-un if he shows up in those southern economic zones or if he comes to the UN General Assembly and speaks, people will say this is a uh, reform-minded North Korean leader, the arrival of um, a great reform-minded open global statesman from North Korea. Right, right. So Han Park, listening yeah, to that exactly. timeline, it's difficult not to think that Trump is being played right now, right? Well, in a way, in a way, Trump is being played uh, by Kim Jong-un. But Kim Jong-un is not interested in opening up and privatizing the economy whatsoever. I think we assume Kim Jong-un as a uh, uh, Korean Deng Xiaoping may lead, lead us to think that Kim Jong-un will be a little capitalist uh, and uh, a little private ownership and capitalist-oriented leader. That is not in the card. North Korean Party 
is not like that. And you know what controls North Korea right now is the party, Korea Labour Party, rather than Kim Jong Un himself. He's different from third right. world usual dictator. Right, Mr. So Park. Does a, sorry to interrupt you. Does yeah. that mean that reunification is? completely impossible then, because then you have a very different country south of the border. If you're saying North Korea is fundamentally different and it doesn't want Western-style democracy right. or however you deny it, is it impossible to ever reunify because those two things don't go together, do they? Well, yeah, if they unify in the form of a confederate state as is being agreed upon by both regimes, that North Korea will maintain its ideology, its rule characteristics, South Korea will do likewise. And then you have a coordinating kind of system uh, in, in the form of confederate state. So they have a way of genuine way of dealing with the differences. Eventually, the differences will be right. reduced and integrated. Okay. But there's a way, unica unification. Okay, big question marks over that. We're going to say goodbye now to Han Park. We thank you for being with us, sir. Uh, gentlemen, you, you stay uh, where you are. We're going to bring in Steve Oaken from Singapore now. He's a former deputy general counsel in the U.S. government during Bill Clinton's administration. Steve Oaken, good to have you on the program. Democrats are not necessarily very happy with the principle here because they feel that Trump has one principle for North Korea and one principle for the Iran deal. Is that the way you see it? Well, what I really see is I'm that sorry, he sorry. has just a very transactional approach to foreign affairs. He has a transactional approach uh, to economic policy, and that doesn't work. We need to have a multi-party approach that has an engagement with the global system, and that's really um, what's lacking with Trump's economic engagement and, and foreign policy engagement. Okay, transactional. As part of this transactional thing, one of the concessions that he mentioned is with regards to the war games and the future of the U.S. troops on the peninsula. Let's have, have a little listen to this, and I want Sung Yung Lee and Bruce to respond to this in a second. Let's have a, a quick listen. We have right now 32,000 soldiers in South Korea. And I'd like to be able to bring them back home. But that's not part of the equation right now. At some point, I hope it will be, but not right now. We will be stopping the war games, which will save us a tremendous amount of money, unless and until we see that the future negotiation is not going along like it should. Sung Yung Lee, what do you think? Good idea, stopping the war games. The North Koreans felt provoked every time the U.S. and South Korea did those war games. Trump is saying, okay, we're going to stop them. What do you think? First, a couple of technical mistakes by the President of the United States. There aren't 32,000 U.S. troops in South Korea, more like 28,500. War games uh, doesn't apply. That term does not apply to the combined U.S. ROK military exercises that are defensive in nature and have been going on since 1976. Routine defensive exercises. North Korea complains, of course, and it's a long-standing North Korean demand. Uh, on the U.S. to call off these exercises. So that's a concession. I would say a unilateral concession given by President Trump to, I think, maintain the illusion of a mm -hmm. dramatic breakthrough, a successful Singapore moment. And I think that does compromise the readiness, the preparedness of South Korea and the United States in the event of North Korean adventurism. And, you know, that's not a far-fetched um, presumption because North Korea has indeed killed lots of Americans right. and South Koreans over the decades with controlled, limited but lethal attacks. Um, but I think this concession also presages further concessions, phased withdrawal of U.S. troops. The president mentioned himself he would like to see that, although he did not admit that is where he's right. headed. But I can see that happening, and it wouldn't be radical. It wouldn't be unprecedented. In the past, U.S. presidents have used the troops card vis-a-vis -vis South Korea and vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And the line of thinking goes like this very quickly. If the U.S. withdraws troops, 
the U.S. might be sending a stern message both to Seoul and to Pyongyang, to its ally, to South Korea. If you cozy up to North Korea too much, we may abandon you, you know, leave you alone by yourself to fend for yourself. So beware. Right. To North Korea, if we remove our troops out of harm's way within the range of your artillery, we might be prone to striking first. So beware. Now, that, on a very superficial, logical level, seems to make sense, but I think that is miscalculation, and I don't think that's in the best interest of the United States when you consider the global context of U.S. Right. policy toward the region. Bad idea, stopping those drills, which Trump himself called war games? Yeah, it's an extremely bad idea. It is a unilateral concession. Uh, since January of 2015, North Korea had floated a freeze-for-freeze freeze proposal uh, where they would freeze uh, their nuclear and missile tests, which they are prohibited from doing, uh, according to U.N. resolutions, in return for the allowable uh, U.S.-South Korean military exercises. Of, the, of course, the U.S. always rejected that. They were, North Korea was trying to offer something they didn't legally possess. And, of course, nothing was ever said about North Korea's own summer training cycle and winter training cycle. So uh, what the president has done is embraced one half uh, of that proposal right. uh, in not even getting anything in return because there's no comment about the freeze of tests in the summit document. Steve? Yeah, look, the president has withdrawn from every multilateral agreement that we've been a part of. He withdrew from Paris. He withdrew from the TPP. He withdrew from Iran. He has not shown any ability to create a new agreement. What we have here today is not a new agreement. It is a unilateral concession by the U.S. on a number of fronts for a reaffirmation of what the North Koreans had already agreed to two weeks ago with the South Koreans. And so I don't think a lot came out of today. Now, talking is better than war. I mean, I think you would argue this strategy is better than a bloody nose strategy, but it's certainly not what we expected going into today. Steve, what if he pulls it off? Yes, North Korea does terrible things, horrible human rights record. There are gulags in the country. Um, UN reports say that they're committing crimes against humanity, against their own people. Yes, they threaten the U.S. and South Korea. Yes, they have nuclear weapons. But what if Trump has started a process that he sees through to the end and he pulls it off? There's denuclearization and North Korea comes in from the cold, opens up. Will you concede, okay, maybe there's some method to the madness. Trump has pulled it off. Hats off to the man. Credit where it's due. Look, if he can do a Nixon goes to China, then by all means, he should get all the same credit that President Nixon got when he opened up China. I think President Clinton should get a lot of credit for Vietnam. President Obama should get a lot of credit for Cuba. The same that President Trump should get a lot of credit if this works. He is going down a very interesting strategy and path to get there, not the one that he laid out saying that we wanted clear, uh, complete verifier, uh, verifiable irreversible need nuclearization before we started negotiating. We're negotiating before we get there. But if this works, of course he gets credit. Okay, gentlemen, this was infinitely interesting. Unfortunately, I've got to move on. But I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Seung Yung Lee, Steve Oaken, and Bruce Klingner. Thank you. Thanks again. After the break, with North Korea pledging to denuclearize, what's stopping the rest of the world from following suit? And we ask if it's unwise for North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons. After the historic summit in Singapore, are we now one step closer to a world without nukes? Well, right now, it's thought there are at least 15,000 nuclear weapons spread across nine countries. That's enough to kill everyone on Earth many times over. But in the history of the world, nuclear weapons have only been used twice, both times by the United States. But that hasn't stopped Washington from trying to prevent others from becoming nuclear powers. Just ask Iran. So, will we ever be free of nuclear weapons? Here's Shoaib Hassan. Despite talking peace in Singapore, many people say Donald Trump's recent decision to end the nuclear deal with Iran has made the world a more dangerous place. In the meantime, powerful sanctions will go into full effect. If the regime continues its nuclear aspirations, it will have bigger problems than it has ever had before. Iran's response was outrage and an announcement it would now push ahead with enriching uranium. 
That's a first step towards building nuclear weapons in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT, of which it is a signatory. The NPT is an international treaty that governs the use of nuclear technology and has been enforced since 1970. It recognizes two classes of nuclear states, those that had developed weapons before January 1, 1967, and those that hadn't. The first category includes the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. Under the treaty, these five commit to helping the rest of the world to develop peaceful uses for nuclear energy, as long as they don't also develop nuclear weapons. But five other states refuse to sign the NPT, and four of these have now developed nuclear weapons. They are India, Pakistan, North Korea and Israel. The first three have openly tested weapons and delivery systems. While Israel has chosen to adopt a policy of neither confirming nor denying its program. In all, there are at least 15,000 nuclear weapons deployed on land, air and sea around the world. Experts say that's enough to destroy the world many times over. Officials say the likelihood of such a global conflict is low, as 90% of the weapons are with the US or Russia, with fairly stringent safeguards in place. But they admit that a regional conflict might happen, potentially between India and Pakistan, who have already fought four conventional conflicts, and now Iran's decision to reignite its enrichment program could add an even more dangerous dimension to its nuclear rivalry with Israel. So, is the NPT now failing after years of helping to lessen the threat of nuclear weapons? And exactly what risk does the emergence of new weapon states pose to the world? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Tehran is Iranian affairs analyst Dr. Sayed Mustafa Hoshcheshim. In Athens, we have the author of Nuclear Iran, David Patrikarakos. And in Boston, Dr. Jim Walsh. He's a senior research associate at MIT's Security Studies Program. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Uh, Mustafa Hoshcheshim, let me start with you. As an Iranian watching things unfold in Singapore, does it annoy you? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, no, it doesn't annoy us because uh, uh, denuclearization is a requirement of modern world. Uh, the, uh, the nuclear weapons of the declared uh, nuclear weapons states uh, are endangering global peace and security. But the point is that the U.S. is not in talks with North Korea for the promotion of peace and security throughout the world. It's just looking uh, at, at it as a way to contain one of it, uh, its enemy states, uh, and it's trying to disarm North Korea uh, of uh, its uh, main power de uh, uh, deterrent power. Uh, we might feel a bit uh, concerned because as uh, we are watching these talks, we remember how the U.S. Uh, uh, treated us. The U.S. is no more trustworthy, especially after it undermined the non-proliferation treaty because of uh, its withdrawal from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, that had been developed under the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, and it shows uh, that the U.S. Is, uh, n doesn't believe in the global values of the NPT. It only tries to impose uh, its own model on the NPT, that is to say, uh, the rest of the world should be disarmed and denuclearized, but uh, the established nuclear states, the five permanent UN Security Council members, plus India, Pakistan, and Israel, uh, are right. uh, not included by the United okay. States uh, pressures and efforts uh, at, at this, you know, uh, disarmament. We are worried that the U.S. might eventually, uh, you know, uh, uh, go for containing North Korea and then uh, they would withdraw from uh, the final deal and move on to, uh, you know, uh, regime change, okay. uh, uh, Pyongyang. Okay, understood. So, Jim Walsh, that's an interesting perspective because over the past day or so, everybody's been asking the question, can Trump, can the U.S., can the world trust Kim Jong-un? We've got a perspective from Tehran. Hold on, why should we trust the U.S.? Look at them, they pulled out of the Iran deal. That's a fair analysis, isn't it? Well, of course. And, you know, if you had asked me the question, are, are you frustrated or annoyed uh, as an Iranian, I would say the answer is yes. I mean, the president had a perfectly good nuclear agreement, the JCPOA. He ripped it up. And at least based on what we've seen coming out of Singapore so far, 
There's nothing even close, close to the Iranian nuclear agreement uh, that's been settled that uh, is has anything like the verification or, or all the different parts of the JCPOA. What we got out of Singapore was some was a vague announcement. So if I was an Iranian, I'd be I'd be sort of angry at it all. Um, but as to the can you trust the U.S. Obviously, uh, I think that that was a question going into the. North Korean meetings, uh, you know, JCPOA or no JCPOA, because the U.S. and North Korea have had a tough history with each side accusing the other of not having followed through on its commitments. And so I'm sure for North Korea this was a big question. It's always a big question when you have a negotiation between two parties. One is bigger and stronger. One is weaker. How does the weaker party, in this case North Korea, how does the weaker party know that uh, it can right. trust? The, the more powerful party to follow through on its promises. And I think that remi remains an open question. David Patrikarakos, after what happened in Singapore, are we any closer to global denuclearization? Uh, well, many thanks for inviting me on as well. Uh, I mean, you know, the, quite simply, no. Uh, in answer to your earlier question, I think whether you're an Iranian or not an Iranian, you've got to be frustrated by the tearing up of the nuclear deal. I would take issue with the gentleman in Iran, <laughs> however, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the non-proliferation treaty is an avowedly asymmetric treaty. You know, it allows the nuclear weapon states to have nuclear weapons, though it does say that they should move towards denuclearization, and it says that no one else can have them. This is an avowedly asymmetric treaty, and it is important to remember that it is actually most enthusiastically supported by not the nuclear weapon states, but the non-nuclear weapon states, the Fijis, the Icelands, the Sudans, the Nigerias, the, the, the countries that never, ever really have a chance of going nuclear. So I think we should put that in perspective. I think tearing up the nuclear deal was a ridiculous thing to do. And obviously what we're seeing today doesn't bring us anywhere to denuclearization. I think, to be honest, denuclearization of North Korea is unrealistic. It's the only card the Koreans have to play, and they're not right. going to give it up. Yeah. So, David, just a little bit on the NPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear yes. Weapons. Um, would you forgive many countries for seeing it as a waste of time? Because you say it's asymmetric. It's the way, I guess... Many countries see the Rome Statute when it comes to international justice and whether you can go to the ICC or not, right? So we look at the NPT, India, Pakistan, Israel didn't sign up. North Korea signed up and, and left. They pulled out. Was a country like Iran's biggest mistake that they signed up to it initially and allowed themselves to, inspect, to be inspected and all of that? Should they just stayed out of the game? Look, I, for my book, uh, which is uh, the, the first in English, at least, History and Analysis of the Nuclear Program from the beginning of the 1950s to the present day, I spoke to Akbar et Ahmad, who essentially came on board a few years after the, uh, the program's origins with a, an Atoms for Peace reactor given. And he said, had he been in charge of the program, he never would have allowed or as far as he could, he would have advised that Iran never signed up to it. This is one thing we also have to remember as well. The Shah was one of the first signatories of the NPT. Iran was not coerced into signing the NPT. It did so willingly, and the Shah wanted Iran to stand as a model for other countries. And this anti-nuclear weapon stance is something that the Iranians claim has continued. Ayatollah Khomeini was said to have issued a fatwa against uh, the, the acquirement of nuclear weapons, which Ali Ashgar Soltanei, Iran's ambassador to the IEA, told told me personally in, in Vienna, he told me this has been done, and Ayatollah Khamenei has reportedly issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons. So certainly Iran avowedly has no nuclear weapons ambitions. It did sign up willingly to the NPT, and the NPT benefits most the non-nuclear weapons. States. And I have to say, look, it has been remarkably successful. When the non-proliferation architecture first began with Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace process in the 1950s, the NPT has only seen one signatory go nuclear, and that is North Korea. Now, one, one signatory essentially withdrawing and going nuclear after almost half a century isn't too bad. If, I don't think many people in the right. 60s would have predicted that. Right. Mustafa Hoshesham, for those who make the distinction between a country like Iran and North Korea, they say, well, you know, Iran is clearly far more democratic and so forth. But they would also say, well, North Korea says many crazy things. It does those missile tests. It does those nuclear tests. But it's fundamentally a hermit kingdom, right? It doesn't have greater cultural or political designs on its neighbors and the region, whereas many Gulf states, the Americans, the Israelis, and others feel that Iran is 
almost a semi-imperial power, if not a fully blown imperial power in the region. And that's one of the reasons why they have to be harsher on the Iranians vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons and ever getting that deterrent than even the North Koreans. Your response would be what? Well, um, I don't believe in that because uh, the United States is dealing with its enemies uh, almost the same. Uh, uh, it's, it's a strategy for, uh, you know, uh, these rogue states or enemy states is uh, going through containment. Uh, when war is not an option, though uh, the threat of a war is present, in order to encourage the enemy states to come to the negotiating table, it's used as a, as a stick uh, along with the sanctions, uh, uh, then uh, the, the best uh, next option is intensifying sanctions in order to uh, push them towards negotiations. That's uh, the way the United States is dealing with its enemies. That's containment. And it's done with regard to Iran uh, and with regard to North Korea. Take a look at the uh, CATSA, or the Countering uh, America's Adversary Sanctions Through Sanctions uh, Act. Uh, it mentions Iran, Russia, and North Korea all the same. There are different principles and rules applying to each, but uh, the framework is the same. Uh, it shows that the United States means to contain them first through sanctions and threat of military action, and then it tries to push back their power components one by one. Uh, the United States' strategy has always been what uh, George W. Bush said. You're either with us or against us. And for each state, uh, they will find their own excuses. Right. Now, when they were talking about North Korea first, they were speaking of its military nuclear capability. But little by little, we see that human rights issues and cyber attacks are bringing up to be put on the table. I don't know. They have not uh, yet defined what the, you know, what the contents of a deal could be, if it's a limited agreement or if it's a grand bargain. Uh, they have not uh, right. discussed the, br it, the yeah, breadth certainly. and the it depth does, and the mechanism. Right. It, and it doesn't, and it, doesn't it doesn't seem as if human rights it does seem as if human rights have the been same sacrificed. Road. Certainly, it does seem as if human rights have been sacrificed. And, and I think it, it, it's worth mentioning the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea in 2014 spoke of evidence of extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions and other sexual violence, persecution on political, religious, racial and gender grounds, forcible transfer of populations, the enforced disappearance of persons and the inhumane act of knowingly causing prolonged starvation. It's nasty, right? That doesn't seem to have been discussed in Singapore. Maybe very little was discussed in Singapore. I want to move on slightly. And David, I know you wanted to jump in, so my apologies. I'll let you come in in a second. I want to ask Jim Walsh about Bolton's idea of the Libya model for North Korea. If you're a North Korean, you'd say, what? You want me to be like Gaddafi and be killed by my own people? You want me to give up my nu nukes and find my country a complete hellhole, which it became over the years after Gaddafi? Was that a stupid idea by Bolton? It may have been on purpose. It might have been. I, I can't believe that John Bolton is very happy with the last 48 hours. He's a neocon. He's argued for use of military force against Iran, against North Korea, against other countries. And this might have been, I mean, who knows? He might have said it on purpose in order to annoy the North Koreans and therefore to sort of derail this process. And it almost worked, except for the fact that uh, the summit was put on track after those letters. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what's in the head of John Bolton. I, I will say a couple of things, though. I do think the NPT has been very effective, far more effective than anyone could have ever predicted in uh, helping uh, reduce the spread of nuclear weapons. And I think also that, um, yes, uh, Iranians have a lot of uh, justifiable complaints, you know, going back to 1953 and the overflow, uh, overthrow of uh, their uh, elected prime minister. But I do think we have to make some distinction between Donald Trump as president and then sort of the United States in general. I mean, I, Obama did negotiate and sign the JCPOA. And Mr. Trump is the most unusual president in modern history. I mean, it's mind-blowing. Right. So I'm not sure we should necessarily define the United States as Donald Trump. Right. Uh, but I, I think we're, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to, to your point going forward. Uh, do we have a situation where Secretary of State Pompeo is in a struggle with John Bolton 
for the president's attention uh, and, and favor. And I, I think we may be entering that phase. David, let me ask you a broad question, and you can fold in what you wanted to say into the sure. broad question. But fundamentally, when people hear that the United States, the UK, Russia, China, France, Israel, India, Pakistan, these countries deserve their nuclear weapons, they have their nuclear weapons, and that they are responsible nuclear weapons holders, and other countries are not, that is fundamentally rubbish, isn't it, David? Yeah, but that's not what the deal says. That's not what the bargain is. Now, in the, in the MPT, the nuclear powers are those that already had nuclear weapons. So that bell could not be unrung. So that was accepted. The second thing is that both India, Pakistan and Israel had to develop their programs clandestinely. And then essentially it was too late and they were, and they were discouraged from doing so at every point. The third point is, again, you know, you have to understand the people most invested, you know, it is not a question of the nuclear power strutting around with their capability saying, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve that. It is the tiny countries that don't have the capacity to ever go nuclear that are most invested in this. So it's not a question of deserving it. It's not a question of people, some people being responsible or not. Although I would add that no one, you know, apart from Pakistan, where there is uh, issues where some parts of the country, the tribal areas particularly, are almost, you know, a separate, you know, a separate entity, uh, there hasn't been, you know, any real uh, concern over the responsible or irresponsible use of nuclear weapons. Certainly not. Uh, I mean, the Arab states, for all their problems with Israel, have never ever worried about Israel nuking them. Uh, look, I would want to return slightly to the current situation. Now, I have interviewed John Bolton, and he's personally an absolutely charming man, but suffers from the singular defect of being quite mad. <laughs> and especially when it comes to Iran, I mean, he's just itching to have a go at Iran. So what concerns me is, first of all, we've torn up a deal that was uh, an, a, you know, a very good deal. The, the common misconception you see between opponents of the deal is that, uh, you know, it was the choice between this deal and a better deal. It wasn't. It was a choice between this deal and no deal. So what concerns me is we have John Bolton, who, when I spoke to him, was, was pretty much itching to bomb Iran. We have Pompeo, who is also like that. My only hope is that Donald Trump's famously short attention span means that uh, that some of them will be fired within due course apparently he doesn't like moustaches so maybe Bolton's already on borrowed time the other point I was going to make was actually you have to make the distinction between America and Donald Trump which the point was already right. made Obama you could not say was a with us or against us person he very much from the first day of his inauguration outstretched his arms toward Iran okay very finally let me go back to Tehran say Mustafa Hoshchashim are Iranians more than ever in recent times preparing for war given the relationship with the United States right now and seeing what the US is doing elsewhere which seems like a bit of a double standard vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians well uh, before uh, I answer your question I'd like to express my view that uh, Donald Trump uh, is not a separate man from the US establishment uh, he has been able to beat uh, his rivals but uh, uh, Mr. Obama, the former president who struck the deal with Iran, uh, the violation of the JCPOA started when he was in office. We remember the visa change, uh, waiver program that was changed uh, then. And uh, they promised, John Kerry specifically promised Iran's Zarif that they would do something about it, but they never took any action. I saw the Iran Sanctions Act was reimposed again. Uh, against Iran, and that was also in violation of the agreements that they had, and uh, it was all under President Obama. Okay. It was under President Obama okay, that you've, foreign you feel banks Trump was were a continuation intimidated of Obama. from, okay. you know, doing business with Iran. But res in response, in response to your question, uh, no, uh, we believe that the United States is not in a position to launch war against Iran. But uh, yes, Iran is preparing to withdraw from the JCPOA if, you, if that's uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the exact point that you want to, you know, uh, uh, you want its answer. Uh, uh, Iran uh, has given the Europeans enough time so far uh, to comply with their undertakings and provide it with, need, with the needed insurances that they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, guarantee Iran's continued economic merits under the deal. But uh, nothing, not more than one or two weeks are left uh, from the deadline that has been specified here in Tehran. 
and uh, if the Europeans uh, uh, you know, fail to uh, guarantee Iran's continued merit, that seems to be the case now, uh, Iran would declare its withdrawal from the JCPOA okay. irrespective of any kind of consequences that might be posed. Okay, gentlemen, I've got to wrap, but it's fascinating because the Singapore summit uh, sheds new light on not only the U.S. and North Korea and South Korea and so forth, but it, it gets us to reinterpret and relook at so many other things, U.S. and Iran, the future of nukes, who should have weapons and not. And I'm glad we could sort of straddle a lot of those fields during this discussion. It's been a pleasure having you all on The Newsmakers. Jim Walsh, Thank you David much. Patrick Karakos, and Mustafa Hoshcheshen. Thanks again. For decades, North Korea has been the perennial pariah state. Its questionable human rights record and scramble for nuclear weapons has placed it at odds with most of the world. But after this historic summit in Singapore, could the reclusive regime be opening itself up? Well, theorist and author Parakhana argues that national borders and traditional arms races are much less important today than in the past. Rather, it's your connections to other countries and global markets that determine power. And with a new seemingly more positive relationship between Washington and Pyongyang, is the hermit kingdom coming out of hiding? And if so, what would a normalized North Korea look like? Well, let's ask Parakana now. He's the author of Connectography and joins us from Singapore. Good to talk to you. Are we seeing history in the making in Singapore? Yes, we are. I think this is the beginning of something new. I think there's going to be a lot of hiccups and obstacles along the way. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but this was different in the sense that, bearing in mind, of course, we have all watched the pictures today reminding us of Madeleine Albright uh, toasting champagne with uh, Kim Jong-il about uh, 20 years ago. So we all have uh, the healthy amount of suspicion in mind. Uh, when we see this moment, uh, there's a lot of people talking about how Trump gave the gift of status and recognition and peer recognition uh, to Kim Jong-un and got nothing in return in terms of concrete guarantees. But let's also remember that we have to start somewhere. Uh, this is a country that's different from when it was under uh, you know, his predecessors because now he has a verifiable, uh, tested a nuclear deterrent. Uh, so that really changes the baseline conditions. If you look at countries like India and Pakistan, uh, they have been much more likely to sign international treaties like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, for example, uh, after achieving this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, milestone. Now, uh, of course, that's very tri tricky because um, one, of the, one of the priorities coming out of this negotiation is, of course, that North Korea denuclearize. And so it's not surprising that that's one of the main sticking points, is what does that actually mean? Right. But still, we're in a situation where I think Kim Jong-un has now looked around physically. He's traveled three times outside of the country in just the last couple of months. It's very different, of course, from his predecessors as well. He does, re as a younger leader, of course, as well, uh, clearly does want to change the economic, the destitute situation that his country is in. Right. So for those who would argue, why should North Korea give up its nukes? Because that's all the leverage they have right now. That's the very reason everybody's talking to them. You give up your nukes, you end up in a ditch, stabbed to death by your own people like Gaddafi. That's the calculus. Why give it up? And I'll be honest with you, I'm not so sure that they are going to wind up giving up uh, you know, every aspect of their nuclear deterrent or arsenal uh, the way that the U.S. is demanding. I think that, again, this being the beginning of the process, uh, it won't surprise you to hear me or others say that this is going to take lots of twists and turns, some of them unexpected. Uh, I can imagine that they will perhaps uh, sacrifice some amount of fissile material and give that up. I can imagine that they will allow uh, some international inspectors from the IAEA back into the country to verify sites. They will destroy certain uh, missile silos or, um, or other kinds of development sites which they already have begun to do and been videotaping that and showing that. So they'll do some of those things, but actually to transfer their 60 nuclear warheads outside the country in the short term is not what uh, I imagine is actually what's going to happen. So I think that would be a utopian sort of pipe dream. Mm -hmm. But they will trade those smaller measures, such as giving up certain fissile material and so forth, 
before hopefully getting what they immediately want, which is a lifting of sanctions, uh, bringing in the investment that they desperately need, uh, and some of those other things that normalize their relationships with South Korea, with China, with Russia, and others. Right. I know you say that global interdependence means that it lessens the likelihood of global war. There are others who say that because things are so connected, it fast tracks the process of possible global war because of the, the age we're living in, right? So as things stand right now, when it comes to the prospect of nuclear war, whether with North Korea or elsewhere, are you still optimistic or should we still be careful that this could happen at any time? Well, quite frankly, we have long been overstating the likelihood of the North Korean escalation leading to an actual nuclear war. Yes, of course, nuclear, uh, North Korea now has the capability and still does, of course, to this day, uh, to reach the United States mainland with its nuclear weapons. I don't think that we were, have, have been at risk of them actually doing it, despite the Twitter war of words. Uh, there's a very large gap between um, uh, insults traded on Twitter and actually committing national suicide. If there's anything that we can give um, Kim Jong-un credit for today, and Donald Trump did so himself, by saying was that you know, he appears to be quite a rational uh, and shrewd negotiator. So he's not a suicidal uh, individual. And he therefore has not been suicidal at all at any point since he's taken power. So I don't rate North Korea in any case as the world's number one global security risk. If there were war with North Korea, a conventional war, uh, an attack on their sites, some kind of retaliation with South Korea, it would still be a limited regional conflict. It would have terrible consequences for the global economy and markets and so forth. But if you're referring to some analogy to World War II or something of the sort, I don't think that North Korea is where we need to be looking. Where should we be looking, very finely? I'm curious. Well, if you want to sort of engineer a World War III scenario, you'd be looking more at a conflict between China and Japan that drew in the United States. You'd be looking at a South China Sea scenario that spun out of control, perhaps sparked by an altercation between China and Vietnam. You'd be looking at something that relates to the triangle of China, Pakistan, and India as it relates to uh, certain maneuverings and port projects and military um, uh, altercations in the Indian Ocean. Uh, those geographies and those countries are nuclear armed. They're very large countries. There's uh, spillover effects across regions. There are factors that are more significant, quite frankly, than uh, those that relate to North Korea. Interesting take. Okay, Parakana, I thank you very much for joining us from Singapore. Thanks for watching this special edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. We leave you now with the most dramatic moments from this historic summit in Singapore. Bye-bye. The letter that we're signing is very comprehensive, and I think both sides are going to be very impressed with the result. The menace of nuclear weapons will now be removed. In the meantime, the sanctions will remain in effect.